I am Nicholas Bornolis of Capital Inc. and I would like to welcome you now to a very, very interesting presentation. Mr. Charlie Papavizas, partner and uh, chair of maritime practice at Winston and Strawn, is going to give us a presentation, uh, Jones Act and the US flag one on one. So he's going to guide us through uh, what are the dynamics, the structure, and uh, the overall setup for uh, Jones Act and the US flag. And before turning the floor over to him, I would like to acknowledge Charlie has been tremendously helpful uh, putting this uh, forum together. So I, I can't thank you enough, uh, Charlie, for your insight, um, for your participation, and above all, for the active support that you gave to us reaching out and helping us put uh, the forum together. So thank you very, very much. Well, uh, my, my, my pleasure, Nicholas. Um, uh, happy to be here. Um, my only regret is that some of my competitors get to chair some of these panels, which is just a joke. I hope they take it that way. So Eleni, um, could you please put up the presentation? So uh, we, we thought it might be useful in this program to include uh, a little bit of back to basics discussion, which is what I'm going to try and do. So next slide, please, Eleni. Um, so I, I, I always think it's a good idea to start with how we got to where we are and give you a bit of history, both about the US flag generally and about the Jones Act in particular. <clears throat> and then talk a little bit about what the requirements are. What does that mean? What is US flag? What is Jones Act? How do you get into Jones Act? Um, how do you qualify? And then some, a, a little bit about it, some current issues that I think are important issues. There are, there are many issues that I could have highlighted, but I'm gonna highlight three. They, they happen to all be Jones Act issues, not US flag foreign trading issues. Uh, and you'll see at the bottom of the first slide I have here, many people don't know that uh, Senator Jones was a Congressman first. He was elected in 1898 in the Republican um, uh, landslide that accompanied the, the victory in the Spanish-American War in the state from the state of Washington. And he was a he was a merchant marine supporter from the beginning. And I think the quote at the at the bottom of the first slide indicates that. Next slide, please, Eleni. So what 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 are we talking about when we're talking about US flag? Well, first of all, uh, the US flag was one of the first the US registry was one of the first things the US first US Congress put together, 1789. It started immediately with uh, uh, duty laws, import duty laws, preferring U.S. flag vessels, both in the, both in certain foreign trades and in the domestic trade. Um, it wasn't until 1817 that those preferences, at least in the domestic trade, what we call the Jones Act trade, uh, was was converted into a requirement rather than a preference. Over time, the United States has not always had a full U.S. citizen crew requirement like it has today. I mean, for example, um, between 1813 and 1864, it did. But then from 1864, basically all the way to 1920, um, only the deck officers needed to be citizens. Most of the crews on US flag vessels in the late 19th century, early 20th century, including in, during World War I, uh, were substantially foreign, were, were not US citizens on US flag vessels. Um, the, the U.S. started with very simple ideas of what it meant to be a U.S. citizen, to, to qualify to own a vessel. Uh, that's changed enormously over time, substantially more restrictive today, uh, primarily as a result of World War I developments. Um, the U.S. has not always subsidized its merchant marine. Uh, it, it, it toyed with mail subsidies for a while, for many decades. It wasn't until 1936 that it went all in with a, a very direct subsidy system. We have a version of that today, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And it, and it starting in 1904 was the first time the United States started preferring uh, US flag vessels for the carriage of US government cargoes. At first, just for defense cargoes, then later after World War II for civilian government cargoes. Next slide, please. So when we talk about the Jones Act, uh, I put up here as contemporaneous a picture as I could find of Senator Wesley Jones um, from the summer of 1920 when the, the Jones Act was enacted. Um, as I said before, that wasn't the beginning of our coastwise trade reservation. That goes back to 1817. 
over time, that that requirement wasn't expanded automatically. People go back and think, well, we must have always had this for everywhere. And the answer is no, no, we didn't. We thought went into, should we expand it to Louisiana when we bought it from the French? Should we expand it to Alaska when we bought it from the Russians? Should we expand it to Puerto Rico when um, uh, that came into, became a US territory as a result of the Spanish-American War and so on? It's also expanded functionally. At first, it just started out as just being cargo, merchandise. Uh, over time, it went to dr cover dredging, towing, salvage, passengers. Um, and, and over time, the law has been made very different because, uh, because of evasions, because of loopholes. Uh, those were closed at various points in time in the 19th century and continue to be closed, changed today. The Jones Act, as we call it, is a living document. It, it wasn't until 1898 that the coastwise trade was restricted to U.S. flag vessels versus U.S. owned vessels. Um, and as I said, there's 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 been uh, uh, citizenship requirements have changed over time substantially. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so one of the things I wanted to emphasize is that the the U.S. registry is really two registries, at least in my mind. Um, it's a it's a national registry meaning a registry where vessels must have a national connection to the country. Um, and that's our Jones Act registry, our Coastwise registry, where this, the person owning the vessel must be a qualified citizen. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. The crew must be Americans. The vessel must be built in the United States. And the market is closed. It's not open to anyone else except someone who qualifies. And everyone pays taxes. I mean, that is, that, that is, to me, that is the quintessential national registry, the opposite of an open registry. In, for the foreign trade, however, we, we have sort of an open registry because we, you don't have to be a full U.S. citizen to own the vessels. The vessels can be built anywhere in the world, at least if they're not attempting to qualify for certain civilian preference cargoes. And the owner can basically get out of your federal taxes because the tonnage tax option it has is, is, a, is a de minimis tax. Um, the US citizen crew is the part, to my mind, that makes it quasi open registry, not, uh, not truly an open registry, uh, more like a national registry. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the one of the things that if you ever if you ever want to get into US flag or you're in the US flag and you want to take in foreign investment or you want to take in a foreign loan, um, you have to deal with citizenship. It's something I certainly deal with all the time. Um, and, 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 the, and what I have on this slide is a little bit of the ground rules, um, a little bit of what does it mean to be a US citizen? And there's basically three types which we have to distinguish. There's a, a registry citizen, sometimes called a documentation citizen. That's an entity that's eligible to document a US flag vessel. Uh, the entity itself must be organized in the United States. For example, a Delaware LLC would qualify. Uh, mainly US citizen, citizen management. Uh, I won't go through the details, but that's as useful a summary as any. And, but the entity can be owned 100% by foreigners. Organized in uh, it was a Delaware Corp, all the shareholders could be foreigners. That still qualifies as a registry citizen. Then we have the next level, which is a controlling interest citizen, which what must be owned at least 51% by US citizens, but otherwise is a registry citizen. And then finally, we have coastwise citizen, which is a registry citizen owned at least 75% by US citizens. And in, when we say US citizens that, that own that 75%, they in turn must meet these requirements. In other words, your 75% must consist of registry citizens in turn owned 75% by other qualifying citizens, essentially until you get to human beings. And, and that's, a, that's a pretty intense test. It's a pretty invasive test. Uh, it's difficult to meet, uh, intentionally so, by the way. The, 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 when the law was tightened in uh, uh, World War I, 1916, 1918, 1920, each time Congress touched it, it made it tighter because there were evasions. Uh, next slide, please. So when you're talking about U.S. flag vessels in the foreign trade, um, their costs um, are higher than your typical open registry costs. 
um, for various reasons. And the US government recognizes that and knowing that it needs these vessels for national security and economic security purposes has a variety of programs designed to make it possible for these ships to survive in, um, in relatively open competition on the, on the open market, worldwide market. Uh, there are the direct payment programs, uh, maritime security program. This is a direct predecessor of the Merchant Marine Act 1936 subsidy program. Uh, there's a cable program, small cable program, and there's a tanker security program that's in process. It's, it's, it's fully formed as a law, but it, Congress has not yet funded it. And that would provide support for 10 US flag product tankers. Uh, then we have the government preference cargo programs, uh, the 1904 Act, as I mentioned before, the 54 Act for civilian cargos, and what we call PR 17 for export import bank finance cargos. And, and last, we have um, uh, DOD charters. DOD, of course, is a huge shipper of things around the world, and it charters US flag vessels sometimes for relatively long periods, essentially five years. Uh, sometimes just for a voyage, just to move a unit from point A to point B. Next slide, please. So one of the other areas where the U.S. government supports uh, U.S. flag vessels is with financial support. Uh, I'm sure most people uh, have heard of the Title 11 guarantee program. Uh, it used to be a guarantee program. It's really a financing program now where the Federal Financing Bank provides the funds up to 87.5% of the cost of a vessel if built in the United States and if registered in the United States for the foreign or non-contiguous US trade. Uh, non-contiguous meaning you can use this program for Alaska ships trading to Alaska, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and um, offshore oil patch, but not to run um, gasoline between Houston and, uh, and uh, Tampa. Um, the capital construction, uh, capital construction fund program, the capital reserve fund program, are both basically 401ks for ship owners. It's a it's a tax advantage type situation where funds can be deposited and they they can earn money tax free. Uh, the the catch is they must be invested in a vessel built in the United States, uh, and then there's a depreciation uh, disbenefit which catches up with the owner. Um, and I, I also mentioned the tonnage tax which is a, a nominal tax that an owner can elect to pay in lieu of federal income tax, which is available only in the foreign trade, not in the Jones Act trade. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk now about uh, several issues, as I mentioned at the outset, that I think are current and uh, are, are worth watching. Uh, they're all uh, Jones Act issues. Uh, the first one um, relates to the third proviso to the Jones Act. Um, the text of the third proviso I have here on the right side of the slide, it's essentially a Canadian rail exception to the Jones Act that uh, cargo moved uh, over Canadian rail uh, so long as it meets the tests in this proviso um, can go in part by foreign vessels. So uh, this proviso used to say in 1920, when it was enacted, it used to say excluding Alaska. As you can see, it now says including Alaska. In 1958, when Alaska became a state, that word excluding was changed to including. So since that time, Alaska can participate in this proviso. Uh, last summer, Customs and Border Protection issued fine notices in a pretty large amount by far the largest Jones Act fine ever, uh, $350 million, um, for um, the movement of frozen fish from Alaska to Eastern Canada, and then by, in part by rail and the rest by truck to the lower 48. Uh, CBP has alleged that that did not meet the terms of the proviso for various reasons. Uh, the persons affected sued the government in Alaska uh, the Alaska court permitted this uh, carriage to continue, uh, but, uh, but left open the possibility that it would agree, the court would agree with CBP that these were actually violative movements. That remains to be seen. We're waiting on the court's decision. That could come at any time. 
Next slide, please. Um, this this is this is a sleeper issue. Many people forget about it, but there's a there's an active case uh, in the um, District of Columbia Federal Court where um, several Jones Act trade associations and then an individual have sued CBP, claiming that CBP has misinterpreted the Jones Act. Uh, the Jones Act, of course, applies to merchandise. It applies to transportation. Uh, Customs has long said that merchandise does not include vessel equipment. The rub is that they define vessel equipment to mean things necessary for the functioning of the vessel. And that has bled over into things like things a vessel might install, that that would be considered vessel equipment. Um, the, that has been challenged. Uh, the suit is long pending from November 19th, uh, November 2017, it's, it's, it's only, um, um, uh, it's still pending. It's only in December of 2019 that CBP issued um, some guidance that clarified it, both on uh, vessel equipment and for short uh, movements of vessels. This is very important for installation situations, both oil and gas and renewable energy. Uh, this case has a lot of potential to change the way people think about offshore movements of vessels. So it's something to watch. Next slide, please. So last but not least, I wanna talk a little bit about offshore wind. I know you have a panel, I think it's tomorrow on offshore wind. I'll be interested to see what the companies say about the current status of things. You may have heard that yesterday and today, uh, um, uh, BOEM, uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management has been going through an auction with huge numbers being bid uh, for lease areas off the New York fight. Um, that shows that the interest is there. Um, the Jones Act, it wasn't always clear that the Jones Act applied to offshore wind. That issue was resolved in early 2021. Um, however, CBP, which issues rulings that help companies understand what they can and can't do with foreign vessels, what they must do with US flag qualified vessels, uh, has been lagging a lot. And so there are numerous issues. I deal with them all the time. Uh, wind turbine installation vessel issues on moving things around, uh, moving people around, um, uh, and lots of cable issues. Cable, uh, where cable can be laid by a foreign vessel, where it can't, where, what, what happens when you wet store cable, um, and cable burial issues, which are, which are maybe the most vexing of all. So that's, that's all I have. Uh, next slide, please. So that's some propaganda, and then I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take questions if anyone has any. Um, I hope this has been useful uh, in giving you sort of a little bit of a back to basics kind of discussion and um, help set up some of the uh, panels that you're gonna be hearing today and tomorrow. Nicholas. Charlie, thank you very much for uh, a very insightful presentation. It's exactly what we needed to get uh, exactly. The Jones Act and the US flag are quite um, specific in terms of their structure and requirements. And uh, you managed to take us through uh, a fairly complicated uh, topic with simple terms so we can all understand it. Well, if it, if it wasn't complicated, I wouldn't be able to make a living. So yes. It's complicated. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I see. Uh, so one of the questions that we have is, can you comment uh, at all on the Dredge Act and how that might impact uh, cable uh, lay operations for offshore wind? Yeah, well, the, well, the, the Dredging Act um, does provide that dredging uh, must occur in US uh, waters, meaning out to three nautical miles and beyond if uh, for, energy related purposes uh, in a qualified US flag vessel. The problem with the law is it doesn't define the word dredging. And CBP has defined it over time essentially to mean excavation. But, um, but, it's all, but CBP has also said that use of water jets to emulsify the seabed is not dredging. Use of a mechanical plow, use of a mechanical device to create a trench to bury a cable is dredging. So 
uh, having now seen uh, diagrams, pictures, and specs of dozens of devices, there are many that have a little bit of both. And Customs so far has not given very clear guidance about which devices qualify uh, to be used by a foreign vessel and which do not. And so watch this space. We'll see what happens over the next six, 12 months. Thank you. Charlie, I think we came to the end of our allotted uh, time. Again, I wanted to thank you very much because you've been uh, uh, more than tremendous uh, in terms of uh, helping to put this forum together. And uh, we look happy, forward happy to-, to do it. Happy to do it. You should have one of these every month. Well, we are going to do a webinar with you soon on a topic uh, that uh, you choose. I think uh, exactly we need to keep the information flow and the momentum and uh, we look forward to uh, having you guide us. Thank that. you again for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Well, we're the ones thanking you. Thank you, Sonny. Okay, take care.